Good evening, everyone, or late afternoon, and welcome to Criminal Justice Reform in the Age of COVID-19. I'm Kate Fulb, I'm Director of Hollywood Health and Society, the organization that's co-sponsoring these webinars with, along with the Writers Guild East and the Writers Guild West. Um, this is actually our 15th 1-5 panels uh, during the time that we've all been uh, quarantined um, to go over a lot of topics under the shadow of COVID-19 and beyond um, into uh, other serious and urgent current events um, like tonight's panel on criminal justice reform. Uh, just a quick commercial, Hollywood Health and Society uh, if you don't know, we're a free resource to the entertainment industry on all aspects of health, medicine, science, safety, security. Uh, you can call us or email us at any time for information or access to experts to help ensure that your scripts are as accurate as possible when it comes to those topics. So you can find us at hollywoodhealthandsociety.org, all spelled out. And we also have a new web page on hollywoodhealthandsociety.org that uh, houses all of the panels uh, that we've been doing over these last 15 weeks. Um, so again, welcome. This is going to be a great discussion, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, tonight's moderator, Bo Williman. Hi, thank you, Kate. Uh, and thank, uh, thank you to all of you who are joining us this evening uh, for this very important discussion we're about to have. Uh, Hollywood Health and Society has been terrific in teaming up with the WGA uh, to, to bring a series of panels uh, to the public and, and to writers uh, specifically dealing with a whole host of issues uh, that we're facing in the age of COVID. And, and certainly uh, criminal justice reform is a very important one that we are experiencing um, in a very heightened way right now, uh, given the events over the past couple of months. Um, so we, we thank all of our panelists for joining us and for your interest uh, to, to all the viewers for wanting to learn more and participate in this conversation. Um, the way that you can participate is by asking questions. Uh, so you'll see a Q&A uh, uh, icon if you put your cursor over the bottom of your window. You can type questions in there at any point this evening. Uh, and at a certain point later in the discussion, we'll start going through those questions. So if, if a question strikes you early on in the conversation, feel free to go ahead and ask it. And if uh, we don't get to it right away, I promise you we will get to it at some point. Um, so with no further ado, I, I want to get to the reason we're all here, which is to speak with our extraordinary panelists. And I'm going to introduce them to you briefly before we jump in. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, DeRay McKesson. Uh, DeRay is a civil rights activist, organizer, and educator focusing primarily on issues affecting children, families, equity, and justice with a dedication to ending police and state violence. He is a Teach for America alum, having taught sixth grade math in New York City. McKesson has been documenting the events of the movement via Twitter and is the founder and co-editor of the Ferguson Protester Newsletter. He previously worked for the Harlem Children's Zone, a nonprofit organization committed to ending generational poverty in central Harlem, and TNTP, formerly the New Teacher Project, whose mission is to support and improve public schools. Uh, DeRay has appeared on national media outlets, including The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, uh, NPR, MSNBC, and CNN, and, and uh, graciously has uh, devoted some of his time to speak with us tonight. Thank you for joining us, DeRay. Say hi to everyone. Good to be here. I'm excited for the conversation. Thank you. Also with us is uh, Dr. Judith Edersheim. Uh, Dr. Edersheim is an assistant professor of sci uh, psychiatry, uh, Harvard Medical School, a psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital, and co-founder and co-director of the MGH Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. The center brings insights from neuroscience, neurology, and psychiatry into the legal arena in an effort to improve the justice system. Dr. Edesheim did her adult psychiatry, uh, psychiatry forgive me, residency at the Cambridge Hospital and completed forensic fellowship training at the Law and psychi Psychiatry, I keep having a problem with that word, uh, service of Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Edesheim, thanks for joining us. Please say hi to everyone. Real pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you. And finally, uh, we have Hank Steinberg. 
Uh, Hank is the creator and executive producer for the ABC legal drama For Life. Previously, he was the executive producer of The Last Ship on TNT, uh, creator, executive producer, and showrunner of the TV series Without a Trace on CBS, uh, and screenwriter of the HBO film 61 about the home run race between New York Yankee teammates Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Steinberg has been nominated for an Emmy Award and a Writers Guild of America Award for screenwriting, as well as a Humanitas Award. His suspense thriller novel, Out of Range, was published in 2013. Hank, thank you for joining us. Say hi to everyone. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, DeRay, I'm going to ask you, I already, I already gave you advance warning about three minutes ago that I was going to ask you an impossible question. And that's to, uh, if, if you can, please give us uh, a brief overview on this very complex and vast subject, which is criminal justice reform. I mean, you, you were there in the aftermath of Ferguson, um, you know, living in Baltimore. You were present for the Baltimore uprising, and you've devoted much of your work to criminal justice reform in a, in a whole host of different ways. Um, can, can you try to get us up to speed as best you can on the last decade or so and, you know, and then moving into the current, you know, cultural shift that we're all uh, in the midst of? Yeah, so when I think about 2014, I'm reminded that we were in the street for 400 days. It was uh, a long 400 days, and I'm proud to have been one of those people in the street then. Is that the difference between 2014 and today, I'd say, is that after, after the protests in 2014, people were ready to learn. There was a lot of panels and talks and books and documentaries. Uh, we're in a moment now where I think people have sort of learned over the past sort of five or six years and they are looking for like what they can do. They're like, okay, we sort of get it better than we've got it before. Like, what can I actually do to sort of change the system and structure? I think what we know is that the, uh, the data though has sort of remained remarkably the same. The police have killed more people since the protest last time, not less. People think that it got better just because they saw it less or it wasn't in the news as much, but there's no year after 2014 where the police killed less people before 2014. The rate of incarceration has also remained relatively flat. Uh, one of the biggest decreases in incarceration in the last decade actually happened right now during COVID. So many people got released during COVID that it will, uh, in the long run, turn out to be one of the biggest releases of people from uh, incarceration that we've seen in a very long time. Uh, remember that the federal government uh, incarcerates around less than 300,000 people. There are 2 million people in prison. The vast majority uh, of any of the work we can do around criminal justice is at the local and state level. The federal government gets a lot of play because it just is the federal government. So people think that it's the biggest lever. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that the federal government only has the capacity to intervene in three police departments a year. It's just not at their 18,000 police departments. Uh, I say all that to say that like the change and the lobbying and the fighting that will really make a difference is really at the local and state level. And that hasn't changed. So I think we have a lot of work to do. I'm interested in like how we tell stories about structures and systems because if the structure doesn't change, the outcomes won't change. I think that too often people double down on the symbolism and like, that's just not gonna save anybody's life. Um, there's been a lot of focus, obviously, on, on police brutality uh, and, and murder of uh, African Americans by the police and uh, violence uh, resulting from George Floyd and the protests thereafter. Um, when you talk about systems and structures, uh, uh, can you talk? Can you talk a little bit more about some of the, the the areas people might not be thinking about as much? I mean, we have people talking about the carceral system, who didn't even know the definition of carceral two months ago, and are now talking about it in a serious way and thinking about these things. What are some of the other structures and systems that we need to be thinking about besides, uh, you know, outright in addition to outright violence and murder? Yeah, so let me just, I'll walk through some slides real quick and uh, to just like ground people in like the data and what we sort of know that we didn't know before. So like I said, the police have actually killed more people since the protests, not less. So like, this is one of those things that people just like don't really understand. And we remind people, you know, people ask me all the time, why do I focus on the police? Why the police? That like mass incarceration is a big system, prisons, jails, like why the police? And I ask them every time, name how you get to prison or jail that doesn't include a police officer, right? There's almost no way that you can deal with incarceration that does not involve the police. So we think about the police as gateway. Uh, this is something that a lot of people don't realize that the police actually kill more people in suburban communities than rural and urban communities combined. If you watch the news, you would think that this is exclusively 
a city problem. It's not, right? It is decreasing in cities. It's actually increasing in suburban and rural communities, which is sort of wild. Uh, and, you know, there are three big databases of police violence. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's no data before 2013. If you get killed by a police officer, if you got killed by a police officer before 2013, you don't exist in any of the databases. And there are three big databases. The Washington Post is probably the most famous. The Post uh, only includes on-duty killings that include a gun. So that means that Eric Garner's on their database, he wasn't killed with a gun. George Floyd's on their database, he wasn't killed with a gun. Uh, and it means uh, that Botham Jean, if you remember when Botham Jean was killed by Amber Geiger, the off-duty officer who walked into his apartment in the middle of the night, uh, she uh, was off-duty when that happened, so he's not in their database. Fatal Encounters uh, counts a whole lot of things, so they, they count things like suicide, uh, they count most instances where somebody dies in the presence of a police officer, which is not necessarily what people think of when they think of killed by police. So a good example, there was a, a man who, there's a warrant out for his arrest, officers get to the house, he kills himself, uh, and that is included in the database. So it is, uh, it is useful information and helpful about a problem, not necessarily those killed by the police directly, and mapping police violence is our database in the middle. The last slide I'll show you though is just about, um, about, about where, the, where the problem is most acute. So there are eight police departments in the United States uh, where a black man is more likely to be killed by a police officer than anyone is likely to be killed by anyone across the country. Uh, what's important about this is that these are not places that you've seen in the news. You probably haven't heard about Reno or Oklahoma City or Anaheim or, or Scottsdale or Halea. Same thing here, when we look at the highest rates of police violence, uh, it makes sense to us that the protest started in 2014 in St. Louis. It has the highest rate of police violence in the United States. You probably haven't heard about Phoenix. In Phoenix, one in five murders in Phoenix was committed by a police officer. In Albuquerque, one in three murders in the city was committed by a police officer. So like, it's just not where you think it is. There's only one city in the top 100 cities in the United States uh, where nobody was killed at all by a police officer from 2018 to, 20, uh, to 2020. So like we try to ground people in understanding like where the problem is, because if we set up solutions only to be for LA and New York, we will always lose, like the numbers will never change, right? Because LA and New York are not representative of the country, are not where the problem is most acute, and it leaves out so many of the places where like we actually need to be fighting. Uh, and that's sort of like the overview. I see, so uh, last question before I, I move on to some of our other panelists, but if I understand you correctly, uh, I mean, while there are a, a lot of big systems in place that uh, lead to all, all various forms of injustices in the criminal justice system, that actually focusing on violence itself, it, because, so, because all of this hinges on interactions with police, that if you can address police violence, you actually are preventing a lot of these, the, the sort of, I guess, efficacy of some of these larger systems because people aren't entering those systems if you can address it on the street level. Yeah, correct. And when we think about, you know, why do we, people ask all the time, why do we focus so much on death, right? Like, why don't we focus on the other forms of violence of the police that don't result in death? We should focus on those. The problem is that we just don't have data. So we know who the police killed because they died. So if you get killed in the United States today by a police officer and a newspaper doesn't write about you, you actually don't exist in any of the databases, right? So because people died, we actually have a fairly good sense of what the numbers are. There isn't any national data set about any of the violence of the police that doesn't result in death. So that's like one. When we think about what solutions look like, it's like we know that it's like breaking the police union, uh, the rules that guarantee the officers won't be held accountable. Uh, it is putting use of force policies in place and the police fight us on that every single way uh, that they can. It's about making sure that like arbitrators can't just like reinstate people. So in Minneapolis, half of the officers who are fired get rehired, right? So like, how do we structurally set up the system so that we can like tear it down where we need to tear it down? You've obviously heard about defund. It's about moving the money away from policing to something else. Like we actually have to be really thoughtful about uh, understanding that the police is like a, a really big house, like a, a huge, piece of land and there's not one bulldozer that'll just undo it right so part of our work is to make sure that we have teams all over the property like tearing it down at the same time uh, which is not a call for incrementalism it is an understanding that like the only way to win is this idea of maximum pressure so it is like we are pushing on qualified immunity and the laws and policies and practices all at the same time great yeah and, and i suppose the data because we can even though there's not a national database because we can track death uh, 
gives us at least some ability to see where the problem is most acute um, in terms of where to marshal resources and urgency and all of that. I mean, anywhere obviously where there's unjust death is a place where work needs to be done, but, but it's pretty eye-opening some of the cities you mentioned that people aren't thinking about. Um, yeah, and could you imagine if, if, if a gang was responsible for killing one in three people, like if a gang was responsible for one in three murders in a city, this would be national news. It would be, they'd be public enemy number one. People would be like, we can blow their houses up. We can arrest them all, right? But when it's the police who kill one in three, who commit one in three murders, uh, it's not even like a news story, right? So like, how do we start to just be honest about what the data is telling us? Uh, and again, we didn't, we didn't know this in 2014 because there's no data before 2013. So like there was no trends then, uh, but we know so much more now. Thank you. Um, Judy, let, let's turn to you for a moment. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the ju juvenile justice system, what causes young people to get tangled up in the system to begin with and uh, to often end up being tried as adults? And can you also tell us about your work in using brain development to inform decisions in the juvenile justice system? Um, How is your approach received? How, how do issues like mental health and addiction play into this? And I know that's a lot of questions, um, but if you give us a little overview of your work and, and also, of course, you know, young people entering a system that is sort of defining them in their formative years as criminals, um, you know, I think sets off a, a ripple effect, which, you know, is, is, is super problematic. Yes, I mean, we, these are um, enormous questions and I, and I want to pick up on something that DeRay said, which is that um, it's a misconception that uh, the feds are, are responsible for most, most uh, criminal adjudications. It actually happens at the state level. It's really decentralized. And the laws of each state, um, really the only uh, uniformity that is required is the federal constitution sets a floor on the rights that you can give people. And so the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior is really about trying to approach um, juvenile and emerging adult justice reform from the point of view of neuroscience, psychiatry, neurology, uh, and trying to make a difference in both policy and advocacy. And the way that works is to let people understand that the, the human being that they are treating is not like a grown-up human being, that juvenile brains are not like adult brains, and that really matters for both which, uh, which conditions of confinement should apply to them, how they should be treated, how the laws should apply to them, and we should take great care not to be criminalizing the state of being an adolescent, let alone the state of being a traumatized, mentally ill, uh, impoverished, or disrupted adolescent. So if you, for example, take all comers, the emerging neuroscience over the last 20 to 30 years has demonstrated that teenagers who really are in the group of folks who are more frequently arrested for violent crime, teenagers and what we would call emerging adults, that they are simply not miniature adults, that their brains actually haven't developed in ways that are both significant, uh, profound, but also really important for the legal system. So what would be a difference in a brain that would matter for the law? Well, for teenagers, the areas in which their brains really have not developed yet or, and are not completed implicate things like impulsivity, risk assessment, novelty seeking, thrill seeking. If, if you are a teenager, you are programmed in a different way, neurologically, to seek out thrilling experience, to have that be more salient to you, then you will find it in 10 years hence. All of these um, sensation seeking, risk seeking, novelty seeking, when this meets basically a, a structure that is stacked against uh, teenagers, but especially teenagers of color, um, then you really have a terrible mixture which sends this enormous cohort of teenagers into a conveyor belt of injustice, draconian sentences, um, poor conditions of confinement. And so what we try to do is use really the neutrality of brain science, because it is pure science, to say, look, these kids are not what you are making them out to be. They are rehabilitatable. Their brains are not finished developing. You should be treating them 
individuating them with respect to what traumas have they undergone? How is that affecting their behavior? Are they addicted to substances? How can we intervene? Are they mentally ill? Have they had a, a series of traumatic uh, experiences that have sent them on these trajectories? We can interrupt it, this because we know that teenagers and young adults will spontaneously desist. 80 to 90% of them will stop spontaneously with criminal activities, even with repeat offenders. But we need to do it right, and that means we need to treat teenagers and their very delicate developing brains and personhoods differently from how we treat adult criminals who don't have um, perhaps the uh, rehabilitation potential that a young person has if you do it right. Um, when we spoke the other day, uh, you had mentioned something really provocative that, in terms of the science showing that the way that we sort of perceive others or perceive the world around us is not a necessarily input that we then sort of digest and draw conclusions, but that we start with conclusions and are looking for input that will confirm them. Um, and, and I think there's, uh, that's really fascinating when it comes to storytelling and the way we think about storytelling. But before we move into the storytelling aspect of it, can you talk a little bit about the science of that and how that comes into play um, in, in the criminal justice system? Yes, absolutely. So the, the, um, the revolution in neuroscience over the last 50 years has been pretty profound. So we now have scans that can show both structures inside the brain, but also uh, networks of connectivity inside the brain. So blobs of regions and regional function is really not what people talk about anymore. They talk about neural networks and how neural networks generate cognition, how people think by engaging these very complicated networks. And the new theories of how we perceive the world you know, when I was a kid and when you all were kids, you learned that you see something and it goes into your brain and your brain thinks about it and then it, it decides on an action and then you do something. N nobody serious really believes that anymore. Um, the the uh, way we think about how decisions and particularly emotions are made um, is that uh, it's not that seeing is believing, it's more that believing is seeing. So in a complex structure of the interplay of your own personal memories, how your body is feeling at a particular moment, the sum total of your experience generates continuous predictions about what the world is going to be like. And then you either encounter your prediction and it's correct, or you revise your prediction based on what you've encountered. This is a continuous generation of possibilities. This makes perfect sense. If you waited to see what the world was about and cogitated about it, in most situations, you'd be run over by a car or starving. And so the, the generate where you all come in, where stories come in, in my view, is that we have to change the collective inputs into memory that are generating faulty guesses, faulty assumptions about what other people are thinking, about what other people are doing. Is that is that thing coming out of someone's pocket in a dark alley really a gun? Or is it a cigarette lighter? Or is it likely to be a cell phone in this day and age? So these predictions about how other people are going to behave really have to do with the collective memories and the collective experience that you all are making through storytelling. Right, and before we move to Hank, I mean, this, in its most reductive terms, and correct me if I'm wrong, in a way, the neuroscience is proving that we kind of start from bias, we start from prejudice. Whatever we think the world is, unconsciously or consciously, is where we start from. And we're either confirming that or, or we're not. But that your, your initial action or instinct is gonna start from a place of bias, unless it's sort of overwhelmingly proved that your bias in that particular in instance is wrong. That, that's right. Bias in the form of collective memory, collective inputs, your past experience. You have to generate a prediction based on something in your past. What has similar situations in the past brought to you? Um, there's a famous neuroscientist who is our, our uh, she is a, the generator of really 
most of the work on uh, theories of how emotion is generated in the brain, Lisa Feldman Barrett. And uh, she would give the example of a snake in the woods. If you're afraid of snakes and you're agitated and it's dark and you hear a rustle, then what is more likely to be a chipmunk you are going to predict is a snake and you're going to stomp on it. When really it's a little chipmunk running across the road. Now that's a very innocent example. Not such an innocent example when you're shooting someone in a dark alley because you are both conditioned in your memory, in your training, in your experience, and in your fear to expect that 99% of the time it will be a gun. And that is a bias that is a deadly bias. And the way to correct that is to undo all of those inputs and assumptions and make the experience different so that the prediction is different. Thank you. Hank, let's turn to you because storytelling television is one form of input um, that can reinforce bad things or, or rewire good and new things. Um, in your show, For Life, um, you know, you're, you're tackling some of the stereotypes and tropes that have to do with the criminal justice system, turning them on their head, exploring them, investigating them. Um, you know, things like Collars for Dollars, for instance, which I hope you'll speak about. Um, yeah, will you give our, our viewers just a, a, a bit of an overview of what your show is about if they haven't had a chance to see it? Uh, the, the work you've done to research for that narrative and, and what you've learned along the way that may have surprised you? Sure. Um, so the, the show is uh, inspired by the uh, true story in real life of uh, a man named Isaac Wright Jr. who was arrested in, in New Jersey in the, um, in the 90s and sentenced to life in prison um, for crimes that he didn't commit. He was um, uh, charged as a drug kingpin um, and uh, he was... Um, Framed, set up. He had he had some um, acquaintances who who may have had some um, tertiary um, kind of uh, relationships to drug dealing, but he was he was innocent. And while in prison, he learned how to become a lawyer. He became the in-house prison paralegal, helping the inmates with any internal cases that came up while they were incarcerated. In other words, if there was a fight in the cafeteria um, or an accusation that one of the prisoners had assaulted a guard or, or a prisoner had a complaint that a guard had assaulted them. Those are the kinds of things that he would handle. And then while in prison, he learned how to become a lawyer and wrote motions for, uh, for his fellow inmates and help people, uh, actually get exonerated and ultimately defended himself and got his own, uh, his own convictions overturned. Um, and so this was the launching point for the show, and and we are you know loosely basing the character of of Aaron Wallace on on Isaac. Uh, similar uh, circumstance in the show, it's 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 drug dealing, but uh, we changed his occupation, we changed some of the nature of the crime, we have, and we brought it into the 21st century. Um, but the show is. In, in many ways, that's sort of the hook and the franchise of the show, but the show is about our institutions, um, the penal system, the criminal justice system, what it does to, to families. Um, and we, we have uh, you know, significant characters in the first season that are in prison, and we, you know, we really try to go a long way toward, toward humanizing um, the, you know, Aaron, obviously, and his, his fellow inmates. And we try to shine a light on what are the mechanisms within the system that, uh, in ways in which it can, it can be abused, um, ways in which it is so difficult and Byzantine and, and to, to overcome it if you, if you have to fight um, for, your, for yourself and for your own rights. It's, it's you know, literally like Sisyphus pushing a rock up, a, up the hill for, for this character um, because there was so much stacked against him. And um, we try to do it in a way, and we'll continue to do it this way this season, um, when the, the character, you know, we, we plan to have him get out of prison early in the season and then come back into the world. And we thought it was time to do that so that we can start to address, you know, many of the things that um, have kind of exploded into the general consciousness because of uh, what's happened this summer. 
um, is to deal with some of the smaller, more subtle aspects of the institutional um, mechanisms, you know, some of the, some of the laws and some of the ways that things are abused. For example, you know, we, we pile on the character in terms of the, just the bureaucratic red tape that he has to go through, the ways that uh, the prosecution can stall or delay or stack things against, against him, um, how they can um, coerce witnesses against him and then, you know, um, intimidate witnesses into not cooperating. And these are all areas where, you know, the, the defense is really just has one hand tied behind their back, even when they're not a prisoner as, as our character is. Um, and, um, you know, police brutality is obviously an enormous, uh, you know, enormous problem that everyone is suddenly extremely aware of, but there are other more subtle forms of abuses that happen. I mean, I think we all know that, you know, the war on drugs, any Clinton anti-crime bill just became a mechanism to just, you know, go into inner cities and, and, and you know, incarcerate huge numbers of people of, of, of color. Um, but there are, you know, more, also more subtle um, things that are done, like Bo mentioned the collars for dollars thing, which is just this kind of grotesque uh, situation where um, police can, you know, log extra overtime and, and around the holidays by just making more arrests and more and getting more tickets and and so you see arrests go up around this time exactly the time that um the people who are being arrested are themselves you know wanting to you know have extra money for their families the, the police are you know in, in many cities abusing their privileges and trying to get money for them to buy buy you know stuff for their children um you know, one of the cases that we're gonna, one of the things we're gonna deal with this season is a case where um, uh, a man walks down the hall in his apartment complex because someone else, a friend of his has been arrested and he says to the neighbor, tries to tell the neighbor, you know, don't, don't testify against this guy. He's got a family, you know, it's a petty thing, you know, but he's gonna go away, his kids are gonna really suffer. And then, you know, the DA, um, is so inflamed and, and, and arrests this innocent guy basically, you know, for witness tampering. And it's precisely the kind of thing that, that on their side they would do every day, um, that they do do every day. And now suddenly he's, you know, this, this person is in jail for a felony because um, witness tampering is a felony just for saying to, to, to his neighbor, you know, don't roll over on this guy. And, um, and then we use that as a mechanism to get into a bunch of crucial things like bail reform. So first, you know, he, um, he's, you know, can't afford the bail that's 2,500 bucks. But then the irony is in some of these low bail situations, um, it's not worth it to the bail bondsman to actually subsidize that because their fee is 10% for 250, which is 10% of 2,500. So now, now he can't get a bail bond to put up the bail for 2,500 and for this, what seems like, you know, it's this nonviolent crime, it's categorized as a felony. Now he's maybe gonna be in jail for months. Maybe he's gonna lose his kids. Uh, then he's gotta deal with, you know, family court. Um, so, you know, we are, we're trying to take cases that put a human face on some of these, these things and some of these smaller ways that things are abused, you know, as well as, um, we will gradually start to confront some of the, some of the bigger issues as well. But there's, there's lots of, you know, one of the things that Judy and Dre were talking about is the, the actually looking at these abuses with a critical eye, with detail and a level of nuance, whether it's the brain chemistry of the person who's arrested or what's really going on in which cities, in which areas, and, 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 and actually looking at it, um, with a specific and critical eye as opposed to the histrionics of our of our media which is just so incredibly reductive so so you hope that there's some power in the storytelling of just um taking doing a story that's not often dealt with that's not a trope 
and it's not one that people have already seen and heard and they don't want to be lectured to, but just taking a really small story and looking at the details of which, how the system um, can be abusive and stack things so against, uh, against people and just humanizing that person, showing how flawed the system can be, showing the cost to the people around that person. And, you know, that, you know, if it succeeds, it creates empathy and it, it, it brings people into it. And it, it, it cha also it changes the nature of the characters that you're focusing on. You're focusing on the people that are arrested instead of what's been happening on TV for, you know, 40 years, which is focusing on the, the lawyers and the cops. Well, speaking of what's been happening on TV for 40 years, uh, you know, the role of the artist is supposed to be to reflect the world around us, but oftentimes we end up reflecting just other art that can reinforce uh, stereotypes and tropes that we see time and time again. Um, DeRay, I mean, is, you know, are there particular television shows, movies, that you think have gotten it right or gotten it wrong or somewhere in between? What are, what are or, and or, what are some of the tropes you see in terms of the way that uh, police are being depicted, their interactions with civilians um, that drive you crazy? Or that you're just like, why do we keep telling these stories or playing, paying so much of emphasis on this and not the other thing? Um, you know, as it, it, someone who is seeing real life for what it is, what are we not getting right in terms of what we're failing to reflect? Yeah, I think uh, there's not a lot of things that get it right. There are a lot that get it wrong, I will say, is you even think about things like Zootopia, one of the biggest tropes is um, you see that it becomes okay for the police to just like terrorize people in the name of finding the bad guy. So like there's that scene in Zootopia where uh, she literally like destroys that miniature neighborhood because she's like trying to find the bad guy and you're like the neighborhood just become like collateral consequences, right? So that theme is actually just like strewn throughout uh, the way people put narratives together is if it's okay that they like destroy your property, harm your kid, do whatever in the name of finding the bad guy. When we look at the data, it's like only 5% of the arrests that happen in the United States are actually arrests for violent crime. It's just not what people think it is. But if you watch TV, you think that like every arrest in America was like a violent crime arrest. And like, that's just not true. You know, we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined. It's just not, not what people think. The second is like traffic stops. Like there's this, uh, there's this idea that like traffic stops are really dangerous for the police. And you're like, traffic stops not dangerous for the police. And it comes from this study that was done in 1963 that sort of suggested a third of all the police officers killed or killed at traffic stops. And it is the birth of this genre in Hollywood of like dangerous traffic stops. Uh, when the real data is that one in 6 million traffic stops result in the death of a police officer. It's just not the single biggest cause of death for police is suicide. It's just not communities didn't do that. Uh, but if you if you watch people tell this story, it's like you would think that the police are the people actually who are under siege all day. And like, that's just not true. Um, Judy, will you talk to us a little bit about in terms of rewiring our brains in a way, um, what are some of the sort of hardwired in maybe because of sort of societal conditioning narratives or tropes that you see or confront that you think are really damaging to us that, that we need to really address? And, and what are, what's the antidote? Like what, what can we be focusing on that might help us undo some of that rewiring re and rewire ourselves? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, in terms of Hank and, and, and uh, DeRay, we really, uh, we want to individuate. The, the problem is this complete overgeneralization, um, which allows a kind of simple heuristic to govern uh, our approach to criminal justice and p sentencing. So from a doctrinal point of view, there are doctrines in, in the criminal law in particular, which, which push a narrative of, of what criminals are like that is just not true, particularly in the uh, young adult and juvenile range. So, a couple of those would be something like the felony murder doctrine. And that is a doctrine uh, that says, if a group of people participate in the commission of a felony, if someone dies, then the mens rea or the mental state uh, for first degree murder is attributed to everyone and they all are convictable for first degree murder. 
that's called vicarious intent or imputed intent. If you're applying that concept to grown-ups and everybody decides to rob a liquor store and split the proceeds and the liquor store clerk dies, you can actually, it's fair to say that everyone who participated as a grown-up in that enterprise perhaps understood that if you carry a gun into a liquor store, someone might die. But if you impute intent to teenagers, then you're making a grave mistake in false equivalencies, and it sends so many away on, under false impressions. So here would be a correction. Kids don't perceive risks the way grown-ups do. They don't calculate outcomes. They don't have the experience or the wiring to do that. They particularly don't do that under what's called hot contexts, thrills, arousal, the presence of peers. That's how crimes happen in groups of teenagers. So if you are the 14-year-old younger brother of the 18-year-old kid who, who says, Joe, you can ride along with us tonight, you're not thinking, I am involved in a joint enterprise to rob a liquor store that might result in death. What Joey is thinking is, I finally get to ride with the big kids. I'm one of them. This is thrilling. And so imputing grown-up intent to plan and murder is a misunderstanding of teenagehood and what it, are the motivators. And Hank, you also said something about... Uh, about substance use disorders and how they, the role that they play. The misconception of substance use disorders in both, you know, in all forms of media, but within the justice system, I think these misunderstandings are, are sometimes um, held as misconceptions and not, and not prejudices. Sometimes they're outright prejudices. Um, certainly the war on drugs was, um, you know, just an extension of structural racism and, and a siege on inner cities. But even reasonable people in the justice system still have unreasonable ideas about addiction. And one of our, uh, one of the thrusts in our interventions in various programs for advocacy, for teaching judges, uh, for teaching law enforcement officers or uh, prosecutors or defense attorneys, is to try to move a medical model of substance use disorders into, uh, into the justice system. So when Hank talked about conditions of probation that nobody could meet, you cannot order someone not to be addicted. And if your probation or your pretrial depends on you being clean and you pop positive once on your drug test, you will be surrendered back into jail. If you were in a medical clinic, what the addictions medicine person would say, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, you need tighter treatment. We have to change your medications. We have to see you more often. We have to involve your family and we have to enhance your treatment intensity if there's a setback. And we expect 15 to 20 setbacks in the first year. No medical professional would think that if they treated someone for the first time for a, for a socked in addiction, that this would be an uphill climb to sobriety. But the justice system still thinks so and punishes people for popping positive with very severe consequences, primarily uh, surrender into jail. I mean, I think that you make some great points about our misunderstandings about, I mean, we've, we've criminalized drug addiction, which I think many, many people are, are, are acknowledging is obviously just obtuse and there's such a lack of nuance in how this monolithic system treats individual people as if the, the premise is that they're not people and that they're not that the circumstances are not fluid and they're not specific and i think the felony murder law which i, I we, i've talked about for a year and a half wanted to, to deal with on the show even if they're not children, it's, it's, it's a crazy law. I mean, it's a crazy law in that even if you were 19 or 20 years old and you walked into that liquor store and one of the people that you were with, you know, just lost, lost his cool, lost his mind, you know, was, and, and shot the guy. If you didn't walk in there intending to murder the guy, then, then you, you know, the 
to me, the worst that you should be charged with is, 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 is robbery, you know, and, and at least there has to be some discussion, some nuance, some specificity of what did, what did that 19 year old know? What did he know about the people that he walked in there with? Did he just meet the guy that pulled out the gun that night? Did he, or did he know him for 10 years and know that he was, you know, highly capable of this? Like there, there has to be a degree of discretion and mitigating circumstances on a case by case basis um, for any of these kinds of things. But the felony murder law is so, um, so strict and so difficult to overcome. Um, and it just, it just suggests that there's an, the underlying premise behind the whole thing is to, um, to have a judicial system that is as, as vindictive and punitive as it can possibly be, as opposed to um, let's, look for, um, let's look for a mitigating circumstance that, that suggests that this person made a, made a mistake in a moment, as opposed to let's, let's, let's look for a reason for that, as opposed to let's, let's look for a reason to throw their whole life away. And it's just all backwards, you know, it should be constructed to be the most generous. We, we may, you know, there are people who want to abolish prisons altogether and, and you know, and, and maybe we should. What, what would we do with people who are truly, you know, psychopathic, violent, dangerous, and, uh, you know, that's a, maybe a different discussion, but it, it's for sure that our whole approach from the beginning is, is not a generous one you know, from, from, from the, start, add, the starting point. I want to add uh, you, something that you brought up, uh, Judy, in terms of substance use disorder, um, which I think is really important because it's, it's a prime example of the way our brains are wired. I mean, and I can speak as someone who is nearly 20 years sober, um, and we, in fact, did a panel about substance use disorder in the age of COVID, which, of course, the, the pandemic has exasper, exasperated, or exacerbated some of the challenges a lot of people, millions of people are facing. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, like several times tonight, the word addiction has been used, right? And if you talk to a substance use disorder specialist, they really don't like the word addiction. Why? Because it already has a negative connotation that is, has either an ethical um, sort of stain on it, addiction is considered bad, or a criminal one that we think is addiction is something that is wrong that is maybe even against the law. Well, you know, as you were describing, uh, uh, Judy, substance use disorder is a medical issue. It's not a criminal one. It's a medical issue. Uh, and so you'll, you'll even hear some people say substance abuse. And specialists will say, no, don't call it substance abuse, because again, you are then reinforcing the wiring that this is a bad or criminal thing, when in fact, it's a medical disorder. So substance use disorder. Now, this might seem like nitpicking to a lot of people, but thinking about language in this precise and careful way uh, makes you think about the stories you're telling, right? So if you're going to portray someone who is contending with substance use disorder, um, and you're not you're thinking it through that lens as opposed to addiction, it might result in a completely different story. Um, so speaking of which, uh, you know, in turn, Hank, will you just tell us a little bit about, you've worked on several shows over your career that deal, operate in the realm of criminal justice. Um, and, and I think some of those shows have evolved over time. I mean, we see procedurals, um, we've seen, you know, some pretty nuanced uh, looks at, at the criminal justice system like uh, Oz or The Wire. Um, but you know, we also have the law and orders and SVUs out there. And I'm not necessarily asking you to name names, but if you could talk a little bit as someone who's sort of been in the mix of you know, true crime and, and crime related stories uh, get huge viewerships. People, our, our country is obsessed with them. Um, and you've been in the mix of it for years now. So as someone who's seen it evolve or devolve or move laterally or forward or backward over time, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience in the heart of it? Yes, I mean, I think my experience, I was, I was 30 or 31 when, when um, you know, the, I got a call about an idea to, to do without a trace for, for, for Bruckheimer. I was, you know, relatively young. I'd never created a TV show before and to be honest, it was a piece of commerce, you know? I was actually not that excited <laughs> about the idea. It ended up becoming like 
this, you know, big success for me, but like, and, and I, I was doing three other things I was way more interested in at the time. It was doing a movie for like the script for Lawrence Kasdan and a bunch of other things. And I literally, it was a Bruckheimer show. I kind of looked at the template kind of very quickly for, um, for what other shows were doing and, you know, came up with my, my five characters and, you know, they were honestly a little bit of, of a trope, you know, there was, you know, the, uh, patriarchal, wh white patriarchal leader of the group, you know, the, uh, you know, super attractive blonde, you know, one Hispanic male and one black female to make sure I had everything covered. It was, it was, it was really kind of unconscious, but that was like what the poster looked like for almost every procedural, you know, show at that time. And I, I was following in the general path of, you know, the Westerns and, and Untouchable, you know, all the, you know, the, the cop shows evolved from the Westerns as, as the hero worship of the gunslinger. And then, you know, but in my own def defense, I guess, Without a Trace was about um, FBI uh, agents and um, they were solving the crimes of missing people and they were doing largely heroic work. They weren't, um, you know, it was not Jack Bauer on 24, which I think everybody realizes some of the messaging. I, I love that show and I, I you know, I really admire um, Howard and, uh, and Alex in a lot of ways. They're, they're so smart and creative, but I think everybody sort of knows the, the constant torture that was happening with Jack Bauer and how he got you know, information from, from people in that show was, was tricky. Um, you know, but, but I realized that the, the characters in Without a Trace weren't on the streets, they weren't part of the community or at the federal level, and they were solving these missing persons crimes, but it was, it was clearly existing in a, in a canon of perpetuating a, a general vibe of, of hero worship of, of, of law enforcement. And so, um, you know, it's, it's gratifying to be able to have an opportunity to, you know, to do something, you know, vastly different now that I'm, you know, much older, you know, more mature and um, having kind of done one show that um, existed in that paradigm to kind of to, to do something that's really against, the, you know, the tropes. Um, thank you. I want to remind our viewers that if you have a question, please make sure to send them in the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get to them. Um, this hour is flying by. Uh, we're, we're gonna go for a few more minutes here, and if you have questions, ask them now, because uh, we're, we're quickly running out of time. And while we're waiting for some of those to come in, I just wanna note that you know one of the hats I wear in this life is president of the Writers Guild of America East, and one of the things we've been contending with for years now uh, is, is a really pretty abysmal record of representation within our, the entertainment industry. Uh, we can look at our own guild and see that it's you know, vastly disproportionately white and male. Um, you know, you're, you're, uh, a union doesn't necessarily have the power to do hiring. You have to look to the employers for that. And so how do you address that? How, how do you get more um, inclusive and equitable representation uh, among storytellers? Because I, you know, if, if you have a disproportionate amount of people who are white and male telling stories, you might have a lot more law enforcement hero worship. Whereas if you have more representative rep, uh, uh, storytelling uh, across the board, you're gonna have uh, stories coming from people who have completely different experiences of law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Um, and that's one of the key things we need to do, I think, in order to tell better stories is make sure that more people are telling stories from different perspectives. Um, I, you know, as we're waiting for it, uh, I guess we have a question coming in now, but before we get to that one, I, you know, Dore, I, I, I want to ask you, you were, you've been on the streets um, in terms of, you know, the, 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 the protests that, that a lot of people are seeing now happening across the nation were happening in significant ways in both Baltimore and Ferguson before that. Um, and I know you've encountered so many people that have, you know, lived experience, I'm sure you have experience yourself, of encountering the criminal justice system in ways that we may not have seen portrayed on television. To, you know, to put you on the spot a little bit, is there, are there any particular stories that you remember someone you know, mentioning to you in terms of their experience or experiences you have that you're like, wow, that's the sort of thing I've never seen on television and I think that we should see more of? Yeah, I, don't, I can't name one thing where I've seen an officer get fired, like, uh, like misconduct, you know, I can't, 
I've seen a million I've seen a million arrests. I've seen a million life sentences. I've seen all that. I don't know. I can't name one thing where like an officer did something wrong. There was like a, he got terminated or she got terminated. I even think about things like, you know, there are only four states in the United States that require the coroner to be a medical professional. So like, if you watch TV, you would think that the people doing autopsies are like uh, the best doctors in the world. And like, that literally is not America. So, you know, we always get when, 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 when they say somebody committed suicide or died by suicide in jail, we're like, who's the coroner, right? Is the coroner some random person like appointed by the sheriff or is the coroner the sheriff or is like the coroner actually a medical professional, right? Because the sheriff has no incentive to say that like somebody got murdered in their jail. And when they're the coroner, like in most places in California, like that is shady, right? And we never see those sort of things teased out. Um, you don't see judicial elections on TV. Like judges in most places, like in a lot of places are elected. Like they're not impartial. Yeah, if you watch TV, you would think that judges are like impartial arbiters of the law. Like they just, like that is not the case. Like in a lot of places, they are like partisan. They, they run on things saying that they like, they are tough on crime. You know, like that is nuts, right? And like, you actually don't see any of that. So I think about a host of things that we never actually see portrayed accurately on TV. Uh, or even at all, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in your experience as an educator, is there any intersection between the police and schools or students that you're like, wow, that would be an interesting thing to explore? Because you don't, I mean, there's a lot of police either at schools as security or near playgrounds or arresting the kids. I mean, anything from your experience as an educator that you, you think is something worth exploring for storytellers? Uh, not that we have, you know, like, even if there are police officers in, in buildings, they shouldn't be involved in the discipline process. There are places, you know, I used to be the chief in the in Baltimore for the school system. And like, if the school police don't exist and the Baltimore city police start police, like if, if their jurisdiction starts to extend into schools, like that's a nightmare, right? So if I had to choose between the two, I would choose the Baltimore school police because they actually report to the superintendent, whereas the Baltimore Police Department is like a complete and utter nightmare, right? Um, I do think something that's not, that is not often um, understood is like the sheer number of 10 to 12 year olds we arrest every year. Like that's just like an interesting thing. Um, and then when we think about school discipline, you know, there are, I was in Minneapolis, I used to lead all staffing for Minneapolis public schools. And we had a finding from the Office of Civil Rights because we were disproportionately suspending kindergartners, right? So when you think about like, what does it mean that you're suspending like black and brown five and six year olds? It's sort of wild, right? And like, those are stories that people just don't, you just like don't see that, but that is happening all over the country. Uh, and you know, the Department of Education is really the only real check on, on, um, on school systems. And it's like, I mean, since Trump has been president, it's not a check at all. Like DeVos cleared the whole backlog of civil rights complaints in a week. Uh, so that's sort of a nightmare, but, uh, but you don't see those sort of stories told well. Thank you. All right, we just had a, a number of questions pour in um, all of a sudden, and I want to try to get to all of them. So I'm going to ask these questions, but it's a little bit of a speed round. I asked our panelists to try to be thorough, but as brief as possible with your answers. Um, so first question here, and I'm not sure whether this makes more sense for DeRay uh, or Judy, but I'm going to ask it, and one of you can jump in. Uh, ideas on how trials can be held in California during a pandemic safely, yet still protecting rights of inmates. And I guess that goes for anywhere that's dealing with um, major pandemic issues. Uh, uh, DeRay or Judy, do you have anything to weigh in there? I know it might not be your exact area of expertise. Um, Maybe each of us would, would weigh in just very briefly. It's been very challenging to protect the rights of defendants uh, and have the process go forward. Um, so I, I still do uh, take individual cases on advocacy basis or as a, or as a medical expert, but interviewing people, uh, trying to, to uh, discuss their uh, questions of mental illness or substance use or uh, or uh, cognitive impairment or even motivation has been really challenging because um, it's, it's very hard to keep the environment a rights protective environment, which is essential in that process. Um, I think uh, in terms of trial process, the same problems adhere. 
Um, I think less, some people make a very great um, distinction because they feel that they need to be in the room with the participants to judge um, their remorse or judge their engagement. I actually think that may be one of the neurobiologic fallacies of the courtroom, that we can, that somehow universal emotions prevail and we can read other people's remorse outside of our own culture or experience and make a generalization of whether someone is remorseful. Um, for me, that is not accurate neuroscience and certainly not the accurate neuroscience of emotion. So losing that dimension of um, uh, credibility, I think uh, visualized credibility is an overrated thing in the justice system. It's been used uh, you know, to, um, to falsely hold up single eyewitness identifications of perpetrators when victims actually stand up and say, I'd never forget that face, um, I'd know you anywhere. Um, there have been notorious uh, studies about the unreliability of that, it's an area in which we've worked. And so it may be um, that, that the perils of, um, of Zoom trials are overrated and actually have a, have a peculiar uh, leveling effect on some of these fallacies about reading other people's emotions or determining credibility of a complete stranger outside your culture and, culture and experience. They've actually done studies that said that judges have no particular advantage in cre more cre advantage of credibility than an AI. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm going to keep things moving along here because uh, we have a whole bunch of questions to try to get through quickly. Um, I'm, I'm going to direct this one to Hank. Are you witnessing, are you witnessing any changes within Hollywood power structures in reaction to the uh, civil uprisings? And if so, do you think of it, it as any longevity? Big question, but try to give us your brief response to it. Um. I think that there's um, there's definitely an even higher level of consciousness about um, you know wanting to elevate writers and directors of of, of color. Um, one of the things that I've been pushing on, uh, and I really want to try to do on for life, if we can, it may be a little bit hard this year because of COVID and adding any additional people. Um, is, is already just, you know, we're already limited, but uh, is just um, making sure that at the ground level, like across all departments, I wanted to have an intern program where there is, you know, a person of color in every single department, you know, editorial, costumes, accounting, you know, grip, electric, you know, there should be some kind of um, studio or network sponsored internship, internship program because one of the things that have like on a show like for life we, we want to hire we set out to hire as many you know department heads uh or of color and and um and then you know you know seconds in command and you know in new york it's very busy and you know in many cases there there is just literally not not even a resume you know that or the person the people are just unavailable um and so um it's really a question of building something from, 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 the, from the ground up. And obviously on a directorial level, there has to be just more opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak a little bit to this as the president of the Guild, which is that, uh, I mean, look, you are seeing some structural changes, uh, like CBS just announced that they have a target for 40% of people working in, in the scripted sphere uh, within the next couple of years to be people of color. 40% um, with an aim to get to 50%. Uh, will they achieve that or not? I don't know, but they've publicly announced it. NBC has made a commitment um, uh, along similar lines. Uh, I mean, showrunners, as you know, Hank, have a huge amount of hiring power, uh, even though they aren't necessarily doing the, the, the functional hiring, that's the employer, they have a lot of input. Um, you know, I, one of the things that we face in the Guild is you'll often hear from showrunners like yourself, oh, there's not enough people with credits or experience. And, and that's, we simply can't abide by that anymore um, as any form of excuse. We have to uh, create opportunity, as you say, 
uh, we have to not let a lack of resume um, get in the way of taking chances on people who are talented and deserving, uh, um, who might not have as formidable a resume because they were never given the opportunity to begin with. So if you rely on that as an excuse, uh, it just reinforces the cycle of people not getting the credits they need to then lead to leadership opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, I, I can say this is something that uh, from, you know, staff writer up to showrunner, from, you know, uh, intern up to high level executive at all the companies people are paying a lot of attention to. I think a lot of it is out of fear. People are afraid of being called out and not doing the right thing or being called racist. Um, and if fear generates activity and improvement, you know, that's something. Um, but it needs to be motivated by more than that. It needs to become, uh, you know, the, the, the new status quo as opposed to reactionary. Um, but but it's, I think you're seeing a lot more movement in the past couple months than you maybe have seen in the past 20 years. Um, and as in, terms, in terms of sustainability, we'll have to see. I don't think anyone can predict that. Um, <clears throat> the idea behind predicting. Yeah. We gotta, we, gotta keep, we gotta keep moving on the questions here. Uh, with no advertisers involved, is it better to try uh, to try to pitch more nuanced shows to the S bods? Is that the best venue for mixed audience and upper class whites and people of color? Um, I mean, Hank, I, I'll, I'll, I'll send that one your way, I suppose. Although I'll simply say that. Uh, you know, a advertising is one way to gauge, you know, that, that, that executives who use, I guess, will scare off advertisers as to whether they put something in development. But, uh, you know, one should not just assume that streaming services aren't thinking about controversy when they're thinking about subscription demographics. Um, you know, and, and I think, like, you know, you can look at a Disney that has a, a mandate to be family friendly and might not necessarily want to tackle some of the, you know, sharper issues. Um, so, so one should not just equate, I think, advertising with more conservative um, development per se. Uh, you know, the vastness of a Netflix or an Amazon uh, allows for maybe some more nuanced storytelling just in terms of pure volume and niche audiences. Um, but, but one shouldn't just make, I think, that sort of simplistic reduction. Uh, Hank, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. If you look at, I mean, Apple, you know, they have a brand, you know, um, and so, you know, there, there, there may be some aversion there to doing things that are more, that are more political or controversial. So I think it's, a, you know, kind of a case-by-case -case basis. And then you hope if you do sell, you know, sell a show, somewhere that you know that you can then make the show that you that you actually want to make you know um and so far i've had pretty good pretty good luck on abc which is a conventional broadcast network where um there'd be some concern about that but but um so far so good there so um we just had these questions just pouring in now and if our panelists will indulge us for five more minutes i'm going to try to get through as many of them as we possibly can um one do you, uh, was saying um, was asking whether stories might change the hardwiring of the brain. Well, I think I think Judy already addressed that, and the answer is yes. Um, they, they can definitely impact that. Uh, someone said ten to twelve year olds being arrested for what? Please speak uh, about that. Um, Dre, can you say a few words about th this? Yeah, so it's for I mean it's the same thing. Like, how do you suspend droves of? Uh, six-year-olds right it's like for misbehavior and acting out and those sort of things so it's like you know one of the things that we've been asking for is for the doj to condition funding and just not give money to i mean the department of education not give money to school systems that arrest uh 10 to 12 year olds right it's like a person it's like those sort of things are things that you just don't people don't think about it just like private prisons is probably like the best hollywood thing that i can think of is that only 8% of people who are incarcerated is actually in a private prison, but like most people think it's like 70% or 80% and it's just not. Same thing around like the way police sort of operate in schools and who's actually being arrested, what that looks like, stuff like that. Thank you. Um, these two, are, there's two questions which I think are, are pretty much the same question. One is uh, what, are, what are some of the more successful use cases or models that cities have implemented and how do we 
replicate them in our own small way? Where do I start? And someone also said, what can an ordinary citizen do to assist in changing the criminal justice system? Um, so in terms of models and what can the ordinary system do, let's start with DeRay and, and Judy, you might have to say some, something to say about that as well. Yeah, so in terms of models, I'm a, I'm a proponent of like, uh, get the wins, you like stack wins. Like there are so many things that we should be fighting for right now. We stack them and then we build up to some of the things that are really hard. But there are a lot of things that like we can do now, like ending mandatory minimums, collateral consequences, like there are a host of things that the, the public is actually more progressive than the best organizing is happening. And we should like lean into that, you know what I mean? And like help people get the wins. It'll save people's lives. And then we build up to some of the things where like the public is not yet with us. But I think that like there's never been a moment where we could actually get there quicker. Great. Judy, anything you want to add in terms of models or cities to look at? Um, well, I, I think that um, the, the great movements in terms of avoiding incarcerating an entire generation of disproportionately uh, black and brown, you know, juveniles and emerging adults is to invest in those communities in alternatives to prosecution policing. So the, the pipeline, the classic, and, and most people in the world have now heard of the cradle to prison pipeline or the school to prison pipeline, that pipeline is fueled by the electoral and political wills of this nation. It is fueled by geographic inequality, by income inequality, by healthcare inequality. The road starts very early. And if we don't invest in our communities and we decide that we're gonna interrupt this pipeline at the end when people have had 10 police contacts and a very thick criminal record, that isn't the most advantageous place to start. It's much earlier investing in communities uh, not, not with respect to, um, you know, excessive police contacts, but with respect to resources that mentor young people and provide them the mental health, uh, substance use, and behavioral, behavioral and physical health needs. If that is addressed, you can interrupt that pipeline earlier. So make your choices that way deliberately. For example, with respect to universal health care. I'm sorry to get on my, my high horse here, but COVID has exposed uh, the, uh, the necessity for universal health care because employers couldn't provide health care anymore. You know, the big, the big cry was, no, people want to keep their employee-provided health care. Well, employee-provided health care disappeared, and people of color who had more pre-existing conditions were disproportionately affected by COVID. So those choices that you make actually are juvenile justice and criminal justice choices earlier in the pipeline. Thank you. The final question here, uh, do you think people will be interested in new stories about the criminal justice system or will they be looking for escape stories due to COVID and other factors? I'm just going to tackle this one briefly to say that good stories are good stories. When you tell uh, compelling stories about the human condition and especially original stories about things that people have not encountered before, that's always a good story. And if you do it well, it will find its audience. Um, and our panelists have shared with us tonight uh, a lot of the stories that aren't being told. And we know that Hank, with his show is tackling stuff that a lot, you know, a lot of other shows have not tackled before. So I encourage you to watch that show. Um, you know, and you know, I, I apologize to our audience because this was advertised as uh, criminal justice reform in the age of COVID. And, and we really haven't even scratched the surface in terms of COVID per se. But, uh, but I mean, one thing that is clear is that these systems have been in place long before COVID. We're contending with them now. And despite COVID, um, our entire nation is confronting them, um, you know, very much in the present tense, uh, uh, you know, after centuries, really, of injustice um, in, in ways that hopefully will lead to substantive change. And storytelling has a role to play in all that. So I want to thank our panelists, uh, DeRay, uh, Judy, Hank, for joining us this evening. Um, your, this conversation easily could have gone another couple hours, and we appreciate uh, give you giving us a little extra time than, than the hour that you promised us. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kate to close things out. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Okay, there I am. Thank you, Bo. Uh, thank you to the panelists. This was, yeah, this could easily have gone on a couple of hours more. Um, for those who are uh, in the audience, uh, we did make a recording of this and it will be on our website in a couple of days as well as on the Writers Guild 
website. So if you have friends or family or others that want to watch it or you want to watch it again, it will be available soon. We're also going to have a survey that'll pop up as soon as you leave the meeting. We'd love your input about this panel and, um, and you can send that in. And if you don't have time to do it tonight, you'll get an email and we'll bother you about it tomorrow. But thank you again to all of our panelists and to Bo for a wonderful discussion. And everyone have a good evening, stay safe and peace.